Hey, Krister. Yeah. So this is like super, I mean, it's on topic, but it's not on topic. I just had a friend message me this morning and kind of picked my brain on a couple different topics. And so then it got me thinking and everything. And so one of his questions was about, um, he brought up the, some of the books that were removed from the Bible. And he sent me this video of this girl talking about Genesis and how the world came to be and how like why Satan was so mad at God because of um, a woman named Edith and like all these things that from reading Genesis, I can see that it's not super biblically backed. Um, and so I kind of expressed that to him, but then he was talking about how some of the, you know, some of the um, books of the Bible were removed and he brought up, um, I guess he didn't bring up the specific book, but I just kind of searched it and it talks about like seven why were the seven books left out of the bible and i don't want to like because it's wikipedia so i thought i'd just ask you i don't know anything about books being removed obviously i've never read these books because they're not in the bible yeah. um give anything any light to shed on it i know we only have like five more minutes of our break but yeah um <clears throat> i I'd want to have a more detailed conversation with the person because when, when somebody would say like, Oh, what about these books that have been removed, but they don't know what the books are and they aren't able to explain anything yeah. about the books then they don't actually know what they're talking about in that. And so the statement, yeah. why were certain books removed from the Bible is a, it's a, it's a false statement because there were no books removed from the Bible because there was no Bible until the sealing of the canon in 397 at the Council of Carthage. And since then, nothing has been removed. And so there has not, there wasn't a Bible until 397. Um, and no books have been removed from that list. And so to say that is a total misunderstanding of church history and biblical history. Um, the reason that those books now to say, why were certain books not included in the canon? That is a valid question. Um, but to say that some were removed is an invalid question. Um, so why were certain books not included in the canon? There's a plethora of reasons um, why a lot of books were not included. Um, but most of those reasons have to do with um, unauthentic writings writings that are attributed to somebody who did not actually write them. For example, the Gospel of Thomas is definitely not written by Thomas. It's a later heretical writing. Um, or the Acts of Peter is a much later book, not written by anybody credible. And so um, the books that we have in the Bible are those that are authentic and those that have been widely received. And so books that have not been widely received were not included in the canon. So... <clears throat> It has to do with the authority, the authenticity, the reception of these books, and uh, the content. Does it line up with the rest of the Bible and what it is saying? And what you see with the 66 books of the Bible is there's a consistency throughout them. And that's why they were initially received by the church uh, all throughout history. These books that now people are saying, why were these books not included, comes from ignorancy of church history. The reason that people question why were certain books excluded is because they don't know anything about church history and the um, process of organizing and canonizing the Bible. So <clears throat> I would want to talk with a person more directly and specifically about it because most of these things come from people talking about something they don't know and they learn about the, this content, but they have no idea what's in the Bible already and what people end up doing is like it's the idea of studying counterfeit money like people who are um, counterfeit experts study the truth so that then when they come across counterfeit money they can easily pull out the lies whereas what these what people do is they go around to controversies they go around to counterfeits they go around to lies and they read all the lies but they have no idea what the truth actually is so um, they claim they think they do but they haven't studied it well enough to be able to pick out what's false and what doesn't line up with the rest of the truth so um, like I said, I would want to have a conversation with the person more deeply on the subject because initially it sounds to me like they don't really know what they're talking about. Yeah. Especially, especially if they don't even know what books they're talking about that weren't included. 
to make that statement but not to have any evidence shows their complete misunderstanding of the conversation. Yeah, I he's not um, he believes in God, but he's um, not a Christian. He's one of my old bosses, but he knows I'm studying the Bible. So he's just he messaged me. He was like, hey, I found this video. Like, what are your thoughts? And I immediately I was like, I because it was just this whole story about like how um, it was a, it was, it was like this short, like one minute video about, um, Satan and Edith and how Satan was in love with Edith. And it just sounded like this, like, mm, like love story. And that's how we came to be like, that's how creation, like, that's why God created that. Like, just like this weird thing. And so I basically just said, I said, I don't personally think, um, her, which is this girl that made this video her interpretation is based on cultural and literal context, a uh, literary context, nor is it biblically backed throughout the Bible. Um, yeah. but then when, you know, when he brought up, he was like, he, you know, he said, he said, and he's just asking questions. I think he's coming to me going, I have no idea, but I'm just seeing these things. And I wanted, um, like just my thoughts on it. And so then he was like, well, what about the, the books that were removed from the Bible? And I'm like, I mean, I, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't studied it. So I was like, but let me ask my, let me ask Krista really quickly. So, yeah. um, so, I, okay. That, that helps. I'd suggest he looks into church history a little bit and looks into the canonization of the Bible because there is so many records of it and how it came to be the conversations around it and what we have as the Christian Bible. Um, and yeah, if he's seeking the Lord and seeking faith, then that would be the place to start because what the, the claims of ignorant people is that the Bible is false and full of myths. Yeah. The more you study the Bible, I mean, you can study it from a purely secular perspective. You don't have to be a Christian. You don't have to have faith. You don't have to believe Jesus is the Christ or the Lord of all. You don't even have to believe there's a God. But if you study the Bible from a purely secular perspective, what you will find is it is a valid historical document. And from that perspective, then you begin to read more widely. And once you have that foundation is that this is actually a valid ancient document that has plethoras of proof and validity behind it. And you can't approach it as a scientific document because it's not to be tested in the laboratory because it's not a scientific hypothesis. It's to be tested in a courtroom because it is a testimonial document, right? And so we have to engage with it in that perspective that this is a testimony document. This is a story, it's a narrative, um, and you have to approach it in its proper setting. Yeah. No. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yep. Just don't be mean about it. You know, we wanna be loving, um, but it's important that we know where we stand on it. We just have to help people. Yeah that they might be asking questions that are beyond the scope of their present understanding yeah yeah he's one of he's one of my close friends he's he's one of my bosses for videography he owns like a gym back home and stuff so I do videography work but we've become good friends and since yeah. like I was 17 or 18 like I would always like share my faith with him and so but he's really like he understands the faith and the uh, relationship side of it from like my own experiences, mm -hmm. but the whole, the historical part, the, all of that, he's really into, but he doesn't always go directly to the Bible because sometimes the Bible can be overwhelming. That's, I mean, it's part of the reason why I'm here. Cause I find it overwhelming. So I want to learn. Um, but yeah. A, so I think, I think. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. You can finish out what you're saying. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, you're good. Um, uh, I don't remember what I was going to say. No, that's okay. <laughs> okay. There's a book that he can read that is an excellent book. It was written in 1989, uh, but it's been revised okay. times since then um, by uh, a Christian apologist. His name is Josh McDowell. The book is called More Than a Carpenter. It's about 120 pages. It's a really brief read. You can read it in one day or two days but it is chock full yeah, okay. powerful information on um, the validity and historicity of the Bible and how it came into okay. be, how we got the Bible, all that kind of stuff. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I'll send this to him. Thank you so much, Krista. Yeah.
Christopher, uh, I was wondering if you could repeat yourself on something real quick. I really like what you said, but I didn't get it all down. Um, they might be asking questions that they don't truly, when you were talking about them. Do you remember what you said just recently? <laughs> um, they don't, I mean, I think people who are asking those questions are asking questions that they don't understand what they're asking because they don't know enough about the topic to have a conversation about it. And so you start asking questions that you don't, that you realize are not actually questions in the conversation. You know, um, man. <clears throat> I think, I think that's so, good. I mean, so for example, I mean like in the new Testament, okay, this is a big one. Um, the words agape phileo, um, and, um, or a copy and phileo specifically, we talk about because of C.S. Lewis's book, like Four Loves, he talks about, you know, agape is like this unconditional God love and that phileo is this um, human brotherly love. And yes, sure. in classical Attic Greek of Homer, Aristotle, Socrates, that's exactly what it meant. You know, that's the kind of love that it means is this, this brotherly love and more of a unconditional love get down into the first century, and that is not at all what it means. Both of them are um, used interchangeably, contextually. They do not carry that deeper meaning inside of them. And so when people try to impose upon the word agape, this unconditional love, it doesn't fit every context. You can't just blanket statements say that. And so people who don't know the languages will make claims like that, but they don't actually know the conversation. So they're asking questions or making statements about a conversation of which they have no idea about. So that's what I'm talking about with conversations like this. When you start asking why were certain books excluded from the Bible or the, sorry, the question, um, why were certain books taken out of the Bible? It shows that you have no idea of the conversation because ever since the canonization of the Bible, no books have been taken out. Um, and so you have to know that you have to know the topic, know the conversation, at least in brief to be able to ask certain questions or get the answers that you want. No, that's good. Thank you. I was, yeah, that's a great summary. Oh, Marcus. <laughs> okay. All right, guys. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Thanks, Johan. Okay, so let's get started. We're going to jump into Exodus and we're going to go through, try to get through the first like nine chapters of this book. Um, but I do want to mention something real quick so everybody can come back to their computers. <clears throat> this list of questions on page 12 and 13 of your manual will help you to do deeper observation on your charts. It'll help you to not be just surface level with your observation, but help you to go deeper, okay? Your manual is given to you, not just to introduce you to this course, it's given to you to be a best friend for you throughout the nine months so that you can use it regularly as you're studying books, right? We want to train ourselves to go a little deeper. And sometimes that means going slower at the beginning so that we can get better as we go along. And so my encouragement would be to you guys is, and uh, I was sharing this with some yesterday, but as you were going through and as you were doing the work in the book of Exodus, just don't worry about interpreting tons of stuff. Do a ton of observation on the chart and then ask a really good observation or interpretation question and interpret it, okay? Do observation on observation on observation. Just write down all the things that you're seeing in the chart. Don't just skim the chart and write a few things down. Even on genealogies, write the stuff down in there that's on the chart. So we wanna be doing a ton of observation as we go through the books so that we can do good interpretation. So my encouragement would be, as you're going through, you have kind of gotten a, a feel for large books now after doing Genesis because after doing Titus, you do Genesis. It's like we taught you how to swim and then we throw you in the deep end, right? Um, so now doing 
the book of Exodus, you have a little better gauge on time, a little better gauge on charts. And so do a lot of observation on your charts, ask those follow-up questions, and then do like one interpretation per chart. Like just do one and do something um, on the chart that is either specific or broad. Don't just ask specific questions and don't just ask broad questions. Do a mix of both of those things. Look at the interpretation question um, section in your manual after the observation section. Um, again, the manual is there to help you um, and your staff will continue to point you back to the manual, not just to tell you you need to do more observation, but to bring you back to the manual itself. So all of that to be said, you guys, um, we, are, we are in the process of learning and growing. We're in the process of training here. And so we are trying to train you in a method that, you know, we're uh, helping you to become familiar with. And that does, uh, is a little challenging sometimes. So um, let's jump into the book of Exodus here. We're going to look at uh, chapters one through nine about, that's hopefully where we'll get to today. If we don't, we'll just continue on with that on Friday. But uh, are there any questions on what I went over yesterday or anything on the book of Exodus right now before we get started? Christopher, I had a practical question for Luke if he's here. Okay. I don't know if he's here. I am. Oh, so our work duty got changed to Impact Center. Is there like some kind of clothing or certain thing we needed to be doing like yard work or like what's it gonna? Happen? Yeah, I would just wear like closed toed, sh closed -toed shoes, um, you know, and yeah, maybe just like work clothes, like be be ready to sweat, you know, wear clothes that are, you don't mind maybe getting a little dirty. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, um, Chris. Chris yeah. will be the one to help uh, lead you guys in that, by the way, today. Yeah, I'm your supervisor for that work duty. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so let's uh, let's look at the book of Exodus here. Okay. Exodus, powerful book. We went through a BRI yesterday and looked at a number of things. I'm going to share a bunch of stuff as well today with you that would be good to also include in your BRI and also to reference on your charts. Now, if you include something from lecture, in your charts, then you can put that on your BRI and then reference just the charts writing BRI, right? If it's on your BRI, but if it's not in your BRI, you need to cite it on your charts as where it came from, okay? So either one of those, I think it's easier to put in your BRI, especially if you're typing it, it's better to keep it in your BRI for longer term usage and going back to it more easily. Uh, but let's jump in and look at the Exodus, book of Exodus here. We're gonna start in chapter one, and right at the beginning, of course, we have the list of Israelites and them coming down and their people growing. And we talked about the Hyksos people and potentially that they were the ones who had enslaved them. Um, if this is the new king, we talked about it could be the Pharaoh that rises up after the um, time of the Hyksos people, or it could be um, the Hyksos people themselves. I think when we read verse 10 here and it says, Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies. That seems to me like the Pharaoh, after expelling the Hyksos people, probably almost say the first, is the one who um, enslaves the people of Israel. The reason that seems likely is because um, if war breaks out again, right, because if they've just overthrown their enemies, if war breaks out again, and they um, join our enemies, right, so potentially they join the Hyksos people, the same um, ethnic backgrounds, Semitic people groups, I think that that uh, seems quite likely. And so um, they are enslaved and they're building these cities of Pithom and Ramses. Now, um, I mentioned the difficulties in this a little bit, and this could be one of those locations where an, a later editor updates the top uh, topography of the um, Bible. You know, they change some place names, some geographical uh, names. It's still the same place, but it's an updated name uh, for the situation here. And they're building storehouses here. Now, what we know during the reign of Thutmose the third, which I had mentioned, is that um, he is building in this region. Now, one of the locations he's building 
is the modern day city of Heliopolis. And that city is the ancient city of Ramses. So um, at that time, it was uh, called P. Ramsey. And so potentially that could be the place where they are building at the time. Um, the trouble with the other one, Pithom, is that there is no city in ancient history called Pithom, right? There is, um, uh, there is no city by that name, but that name simply means the temple of the god of Atum, right? The, or the place of the god Atum. And that uh, could be what they're building, uh, just defining it by that. Potentially, um, both of these places are, uh, are places that we would know about, a, a temple of Atum and the modern city of Heliopolis. So the, the likelihood of them building in this region is uh, very much seen in the geography. They're in the Nile River Delta, the same place as they live would probably be the same place they're building. Now, what are they building, right? They're not building the pyramids. They're not building buildings. They are building bricks, right? That's what Israel is doing. They're constructing bricks. So if you ever, you know, have people talking about them building buildings, that is completely false. Um, if you go to Egyptian records and history, Egyptians did not use slave labor to build buildings. They used Egyptian labor to build buildings because they wanted the, to maintain the integrity of the structure. And they knew if their own citizens would build the buildings, then the structural integrity of the building would be maintained, or they may not be able to trust slaves to do that. So the slaves were the ones who, can, who made the building material. They constructed the bricks, they chiseled the stones, they gathered stuff from the quarries, and they transported it. But it was the Egyptians who actually built the buildings uh, themselves. So um, they build these storehouses uh, or build the bricks for these storehouses. And we're going to see that whole brick scenario come up later on. Uh, in a few chapters. But what chapter one does for us is it, it kind of presses the fast forward button, right? So last time Joseph came down to Egypt and we see Jacob die at the end of Genesis and then um, the death of Joseph. And then we kind of get this whole fill in the gap, right? All the people are multiplying, they've put, been put in slavery, and now they are uh, multiplying even more. And we see the Pharaoh wanting to put to death these boys. Now, we did talk about in the BRI when this might have taken place. Um, but what we see in the story of putting the children to death is the faithfulness of the midwives, right? That even in the face of an evil government that is wanting to destroy the children, that they preserve the children's life um, through shrewd means, right? They are dealing shrewdly um, with the Pharaoh. So... <clears throat> I think the, the lesson really that's amazing from the midwives is that even though um, they are being told to do one thing, they fear the Lord more than they fear the king, right? They fear God first and foremost more than they fear an evil king. I think that uh, is an important lesson here just to keep in mind um, that nothing held them back from obedience to God or faithfulness to God first and foremost. And um, the stories of the midwives then and Moses are very intrinsically linked because they are saving these children and helping the ma mothers deliver these children. And Moses is one of those children, right? Moses is born during this time. The midwives are told to kill the babies. And he is put in a basket lined with pitch and sent down the river. Now, a, a few things about this um, is that the basket that Moses is put inside of is the same word used for ark in the, the book of Genesis. So when it says he's put into, um, where is it? Uh, verse three, right? She took the basket, made a bulrush, dubbed it with bitumen and pitch. The word basket there is the word ark. Um, the same one is from Noah's story, right? He gets put into an ark. And this is a, it's another parallel story, right? Moses is put into an ark in tumultuous waters, waters of judgment where he could be um, put to death and he could float down the river and die but God brings him to the dry land where he's drawn out of the land into safety right and he's brought into the household of Pharaoh so um, you get a lot of parallels here be keeping in mind the parallels in the Bible right so many stories are repeated and this is traditional Hebrew literary style repetition with variation right so um, this is an important parallel here now Moses is drawn out of the water and it says right his name um He's given that name because he's drawn out of the water. Now, the name Moses um, sounds like the word draw out. So Moses, even in his 
infancy already has this prophetic destiny, the same way that he was drawn out of death and chaos in the water will be the same way that he draws the Israelites out of oppression and chaos in Egypt. So already he has this um, destiny spoken over him, which I think is amazing, uh, pointing towards his future. Now, if you look at the name Moses, it sounds a lot like some Pharaoh's name around this time, Ah Mose. And so Moses' name is a he is a Egyptian name, right? And it sounds like the Egyptian Pharaoh Amose. So I just find it um, interesting here, just in connections with that. Now um, Moses was raised in the household of Pharaoh for about forty years. We get that kind of snapshot here in chapter two um, that he's raised in a, a with a great education. Chap Acts chapter seven verse twenty two. Um, so that's Acts 7.22, tells us that Moses was trained in all of the wisdom of the Egyptians, right? Now, Moses being raised in the household of Pharaoh probably learned an incredible amount of skills. He probably, um, I mean, he most definitely knew how to read and write because God tells him to write. And being trained at that time, Moses was probably also multilingual. Um, he probably just didn't speak one language. Um, and he was trained in uh, many, many uh, varying levels of education, because that's just where he was at in the household of Pharaoh. So um, probably uh, he's training that time for a very specific reason um, for what God is going to call him to do. I think that God uses those 40 years of training very intentionally, uh, which we'll look at here in just a moment. But uh, he has this moment where he has an identity crisis, right? He goes out to see the Hebrews working, and uh, he connects with his own people. And when an Egyptian is beating one of the slaves, um, he kills that Egyptian. And then he goes out the next day and he sees un, uh, Hebrews fighting with one another. He tries to break up the fight because they're his kindred. They're his brothers. He, he wants to see them um, unified together. And so what you see here is that Moses seems to be um, wanting to live out his destiny ahead of time. Right. And in Acts chapter seven, um, this is the speech of Stephen. I just mentioned a moment ago with Acts 7.22, but he talks about a number of things here. And when he talks about Moses in 7.25, he says, he supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. So it seems like the, the interpretation of what Moses is doing here is that he already understands an aspect of his destiny to free the people of Israel from Egypt, right? There is a part of, um, his future that he maybe he doesn't know that's what he was doing but as looking back on it you are have hindsight bias or um, hindsight uh, vision which is always 2020 to say actually he was living out his destiny what god had put inside of him it just wasn't the right time to do it yet and so uh, i think what we learn throughout the story here um, with moses is to trust in God for his timing. And that's what you're going to see in chapter three and chapter four, five and six, as Moses is walking out this destiny is to trust God for his timing in our lives and in our situations. Okay, so um, he kills this Egyptian, he tries to break up a fight, and then he flees, and he flees to Midian. Now, Midian is in the um, modern day Saudi Arabia. So he goes over the Sinai Peninsula into modern day Saudi Arabia, which is ancient Midian. Um, right along the Gulf of Aqaba. And so um, not the Gulf of Suez or the Gulf of the Sea of Reeds is potentially it's called, but the Gulf of Aqaba um, on the other side. You can look up a map on that um, and take a look at where that is. And he goes and he lives with the Midianite people. Now, um, he comes to the Midianites, and what we're going to find out is that the Midianites know Yahweh. Now, that is interesting. They know God Almighty, the same God that had appeared to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. How do the Midianites know these guys? Well, if you go back to Genesis 25 and you look at the genealogy of Abraham, you will see that he had a son with a wife after Sarah um, named Keturah. And she bore a child named Midian. And that child will end up producing the family of the Midianites. So these people are also descendants of Abraham, the same way that Ishmael was, the same way that Isaac was. The Midianites are also kindred, um, although at this time distant kindred, with the people of Israel. So <clears throat> the, uh, the question that we get here, right? So Moses spends 40 years in the household of Pharaoh, 
and then he goes to Midian, and it says he, he spends 40 years uh, in Midian. We know that, of course, because he leaves at 80 years old from um, being a shepherd there. And I think the question that could come up to our minds is, in the end of chapter 2, God hears their cry, and he sees them, he remembers his covenant, and why didn't God bring them out sooner? Well, of course, he did say in the book of Genesis 15 that they would be in Egypt for a certain amount of time. They'd be sojourners in another land, they'd be oppressed, and then they would be delivered for a certain amount of time. Um, but why not sooner? Well, with the, the call of Moses as well, you see a very specific timeline with Moses. Right? Moses spends um, 80 long years getting ready for the call of God on his life. Right? And with Moses here, Moses has, I would say, the second most important role in the entire Bible. And, of course, the first most important is Jesus and the, uh, Father God and the Holy Spirit. Their, their role is the most important. But Moses has a close, not even close, second um, in setting up the people of Israel as a nation, uh, preparing the way, getting the people ready as a nation for God to make them their own people to set up the sacrifice, sacrificial system that will allude, of course, to Christ and the ultimate sacrifice, um, to organize them, to free them from slavery, all these types of things. So Moses isn't just some guy who's been out in the wilderness, um, sitting under a tree, tending to some flocks. He's been prepared for decades, right? Moses spent 40 years being prepared in the household of Pharaoh, and he spent 40 years being prepared as a shepherd in the wilderness uh, with the Midianites. And this is something we often overlook. The phrase in YWAM that God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called, is not something you really see in the Bible, right? God calls people who are very much ready and prepared for the role that he's calling them into. We see that with Moses. We see that with David. We see that with Paul. We see that with Jesus. Um, they spent time in seasons of intense preparation and getting ready for what they are called to do. And we tend to very much despise those seasons. And we say, oh, I just wish I could get out to the nations. I just wish I could go and fulfill what God is calling me to do and promised on my life instead of going through the seasons of preparation. But what you see in the Bible is that people go through intense seasons of preparation. Moses was prepared for those 40 years in the household of Pharaoh to go into leading a nation in a governmental sense. He understood the functions. He understood how things ran. Um, and was able to organize the people accordingly, right? God tells him, oh, you need to organize judges, and he just does it, right? He doesn't get instructions. He doesn't get all the stuff of how to do it. Um, they're given advice, and Moses is like, oh, yeah, let's do that, and then he sets it up, right? And so what you see with Moses is he was prepared. He was ready for the call of God in his life. Now, Moses thinks he's a man of poor speech, but what you see throughout the rest of the Pentateuch is he is a man of incredible speech, and he always is able to give direct instructions, clear communication from God, and to be able to deliver that to the people. Now, while he does doubt himself, God sees the potential in him and calls him to it. And so, you guys, the season of SBS is not a season to be despised, the season to be cherished, because God is preparing us for what he's calling us into in the future. And there may be much more preparation that we have to go through. Right? But SBS is definitely a part of that that God has called you to in the season. And so, of course, we want to invest and get as much time, get as much as we can out of the seasons of preparation that God has for us. Right? And it might seem like it's a long time for Moses, but he's being prepared for a very important call on his life. And so um, the Bible will look at his season, you know, and they're gonna the Bible will use preparation periods all throughout. This, uh, this time to, or throughout the Bible to talk about um, how God is getting people ready. So with Moses here, he's shepherds for 40 years. And this idea of a shepherd was picked up with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, not with Joseph, but uh, with Moses then. And then it would be picked up with David and it would be picked up in the prophets incredibly heavily that shepherds are considered the leaders of the people of God. And when it talks about a king, it talks about them as a shepherd. So when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, he's not just saying, I'm a nice guy who takes care of sheep. We like to call it that. We like to say that. But Jesus' analogy is much more deep than that. And he talks about shepherding as being a leader and a king over his people, because that's the biblical understanding of a shepherd. So we start to get those parallels here with the story of Moses. 
Okay, now uh, we transition then. Moses is out with his flocks. He is um, in this desolate area at the mountain of Horeb, right? So this is the same place that the people of Israel will spend one year in Mount Sinai. It's the same mountain. And he's out there at the burning bush, right out there in his, in his flocks, and he sees a bush that's burning, but it's not consumed. Now, Moses has been a shepherd for some 40 odd years. And I don't know if you guys see a bush on fire, maybe it's not that shocking of a deal. And you just kind of let it go. And you're like, oh, there's a bush on fire over there. No big deal. But then as you're out there for a little bit longer and you see, oh, it's not burning up. Like it's not turning black. The fire's not dying. And he goes over to inspect, well, what is going on, right? Because he sees that it's being burned, but it's not being consumed, right? So of course, he's probably out there seeing it for a little while before he starts to go over to it. Right, so pay attention to the details in the story. He only goes over when he sees it's not being consumed. Okay, so the uh, so Moses goes over there, and he is called to come over to the burning bush, and God tells him that this is holy ground. Right, take off your shoes because it's holy ground. This is the second time in the entire Bible where the word holy is used. The first time it's ever used is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, when God says, keep the Sabbath holy. Um, but this is really the first time you ever see it used in any kind of context of something physical as holy, um, more than an idea that is holy, right? So quite an interesting deal. Um, God shows up here, and it is a very holy place and holy moment. Now, <clears throat> God heard the cry of his people, Right? This is the covenant that he, he ha, is reminded of at the end of chapter 2. He hears the cry of his people. We looked at that with Sarong and the repetition in this chapter, seeing their suffering, seeing their oppression. And God is going to recount the promises that he has made to his people in history. And he's going to remind them that this covenant that was made with your forefathers is something that I am remaining faithful to. Because I didn't make the covenant with them. I made the covenant with myself and included them. Right? Because God was the one who went through the animals in the fire pot and the, or the smoking pot and the flaming torch. God made the covenant with himself in that moment, and he is going to be faithful to his covenant. This will be a theme that drives the entire Pentateuch, will be the promise of the land. Right? All through every single book of the Pentateuch will be the mention of the promised land. The people will receive the covenant of God, the covenant that was made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. That will be a repetitive theme. And so when you see that, write that down. Make a notice of that because it will come up all the time. Now, one of the things that I've always thought is kind of funny in this chapter, I still smile about it when I see it. And that is the sign from God in chapter 3, verse 12. Um, so Zacchaeus, would you read out 312 for us? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, 312. Uh, he said, but I will, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I ask for confirmation, I want it before I do the thing that God's asking me to do. Right? And God says to Moses, your confirmation of my call on your life is that you will do the thing I'm calling you. Right? You'll know that it was me when you come back here. Then you will know that I called you. Now, that takes a ton of faith. It takes a ton of faith to say, okay, I'm going to do the thing he's called me to do. And once it's accomplished, then I will know that it was God. Right? We always want to know ahead of time. Um, we want to have that peace ahead of time. But that's not what God gives to Moses. Um, God gives him a call of trust and faith to say, once you've done it, then you will know that I was the one who did it. Right? I think it's a, it's a very... Uh, faith building moment here for them um let's see on this next passage um we're going to move on uh chapter 3 verse 13 through 15 um would you read that luke for us absolutely 3 13 through 15 then moses said to god if i come to the people of israel and say to them the god of your fathers has sent me to you and they ask me what is his name what shall i say to them God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. 
This is my name, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Okay, so God reveals himself here, saying, I am. And it is the, the point that God is making. This is where we get the, what is called the tetragrammaton, and that is the, for the letters uh, Y-H-W-H, Yahweh. Um, and no one knows how it's vocalized um, exactly. We, we say Yahweh out of, um, out of uh, presumption, but we're not really sure. Um, there's so much talk about this. We could talk about the tetragrammaton for an hour just to discuss it. But simply to say, um, the, the phrase means, I, basically, I am who I am, um, or I am your God, right? That is the simple thing, right? God is. Now, this is in contrast to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So they are the central people that are brought up in this passage. And God is not just the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is the God of the people of Israel. And that is the reminder here to the people of what this phrase means. It is not like an, uh, it is, it is big. It's a whole idea. I am, right? I, ex I am existing myself. Um, I am the basically self-sustaining. We can get into all of the theological depth to it, but the, the simplest way to read it in the text is that he is not just the God of their fathers. He is the, their God as well. And what that means is that God won't just be faithful to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God will be faithful to the generation that he called, right? To these people. He is still our God, not just um, their God. Now, this is quite common in, in um, important moments in Israel's history. If you notice throughout Genesis, there's a number of times where people will give a name to God, right? The God who provides, the God who sees, um, the God who is there. Those kind of phrases, and that is the same thing that's happening here. God is revealing a deeper portion of his relational identity to his people. And that's what we see is what is God revealing in this, his new thing as he gives a new name for himself, right? As he reveals his name deeper to his people. And that is, there is a relational aspect to God. And that's going to be the whole central point of the law. I know sometimes it's going to bring us up next week in Leviticus. And the whole point really is a relational aspect of the law. And that begins here at the burning bush where God reveals himself to his people, right? So... <clears throat> God calls them out of, is going to call them out of slavery into a personal relationship with him. Um, and this is, the, it's a person-to-person -person relationship. And so what this shows is that in their perspective and mindset of their day, Yahweh is not some impersonal cosmic force, right? God is personal, right? God is relational. He is, wants to be their God and the nation of Israel's God, not just a God. Right. And so it shows a ton of depth here to that relationship. Um, and I think that's a super important deal. So um, God repeats a lot. I am the God of your fathers. But the emphasis really is on I am your God. And you can think about the consistency in all. There's so much to consider the consistency of God here, consistency of his character in light of the changing nature of the Egyptian gods, um, how they change as the seasons go along. And there's different gods and different things. God is consistent. Um, he is constant in his nature, in his character, and the people can put their faith in him that he is greater. And the whole book of Exodus really is the demonstration of this identity, right? So God reveals himself in Exodus chapter 3, and the rest of the book, the next 37 chapters, are all about God revealing the greater depth of what that identity is to the people, right? We get to see more of who he is understand more of what it means to have this relational identity with God. So really it unfolds before us um, as we go through the rest of the book. So chapter four, we get in and Moses is going to ask for some powerful signs or God's going to give him some powerful signs because he doubts. And then we get into the return of Moses to Egypt. So we transition in the middle of the chapter, um, the burning bush encounter stops and then Moses transitions and he will go to the land uh, or to uh, the land of Egypt. Sorry. <clears throat> So at the beginning of chapter four, Moses looks for any way out. Um, we see, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. Or in verse 10, but Moses said to the Lord, oh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent either in, past, um, in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. And the, the reality is, you guys, is that 
God would not call him if he was not ready for the call of God, right? God had prepared him. He had made him ready. Um, and Moses exhibits incredible self-doubt in, in uh, his readiness for the call of God. Now, I don't think it's humility to do it because God is calling him and then he's denying God's call on his life, right? He doesn't want to do what God calls him to do, um, but God equips him. Now, the interesting thing is that God is not here saying, no, Moses, you're wrong. You are ready. I've made you ready. I've prepared you for 40 years or in the desert, 40 years in the house of Pharaoh. Now, he, he equips him with signs. Now, the interesting thing is he doesn't do any of these signs except the staff, right? The rod turning into a snake. But God gives him these signs um, and gives him this, uh, this trust in the Lord because of that. But I think one of the things that could potentially have happened to him is that Moses may have gotten too comfortable in the land of Egypt or in the land of Midian, right? He's been out of uh, Egypt for 40 years. He's been shepherding, right? That for most of us um, in, this, in this class, some of us are over the age of 40 and we would know what it would feel like to be 40 years old or to just do something for a long period of time. For a lot of us in this room, that is probably close to double the age that we are right now or uh, a little under double. But Think about doing the same thing for 40 years, right? You might get pretty comfortable doing that. I know um, if I was doing the exact same thing for that period of time, it's easy day in and day out. That's what you do. It's your livelihood. You enjoy your life. You've got a family and kids. You take care of these sheep. You know, it's a it's enjoyable, comfortable life. And so when God calls you to do something different, it's a huge step of faith. Um, it's an enormous step of faith, especially when you have to trust in God and you've been able to provide for yourself. You've been in a comfortable situation. Um, and now you have to make this enormous change. So just uh, uh, something to pay attention to here. Now, in 4 or 5, and this is something that Daniel Rogers pointed out to us, and a couple of us noticed this, but um, ask this question, you know, what's the significance of repeating the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob multiple times in this encounter? Because God does it so specifically and intentionally. So consider that. Now, this passage, the bridegroom of blood passage, 24 through 26 is a hard passage. Okay, this is a hard paragraph, um, and it is something good to engage with. When you come across passages like this in the Bible on your charts, do not skip over them. Observe, interpret, engage with these challenging, difficult passages. It's something that we are actually looking for when we look at your charts. We're looking at whether you engage not only with the easy stuff, but also with the hard stuff. Okay? It's something that we do grade on is uh, whether these things are engaged with. So let's read this passage and talk about it a little bit. So um, let's see. How about, um, is it Marcus, would you read 24, 24 through 26 for us? Yes. All right. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Then Sipporah took a flint and cut her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. It was then that she said, A, bridegro a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Pretty straightforward, right? It's all there in the text. No questions. Absolutely not. There are so many questions. God calls Moses and then he wants to kill him, right? What, what's going on with this? Why, why is God doing this? Thing? Um, and why does she touch Moses' feet with the foreskin? And why does she call him a bridegroom of blood, right? There's a ton of questions around the passage. Just, I mean, we could go even into more than this. There's, there's a lot going on here. But um, <clears throat> let me ask you guys. In light of the book of Genesis, what should we notice about this passage? Does anybody have any observation or important points they notice um, in this passage that they think are important in light of the book of Genesis? His son isn't circumcised. The son isn't circumcised, right? Huge point in this passage is that Moses' children, Moses' son here, Right? We know that they came, um, <clears throat> that Moses had two sons, right? But here, one of the sons is not circumcised. Now, 
Why is that a problem, Guru? Because they were supposed to circumcise on the eighth day as God commanded them to be set apart. Where did and he command circumcision? that? In Genesis with Abraham, I forget the actual oh, chapter, oh. but it was a circumcision covenant that he had with Abraham. Okay. Good. Genesis 14. 17. 17? There we go. Yeah. So you can, you guys can write Genesis 17 next to here because that is one of the major issues that's going on is that God had called them to circumcise, uh, to bear the mark of the covenant, which was circumcision on their body. And Moses is not doing this. Right? This is such a crucial point for the people of Israel that in, Gen or in a Joshua chapter 5, that they will even stop before they ever battle in the promised land to circumcise all of the men um, in the promised land. Right, It is an incredibly important action that they are doing. And what that really shows us is that nobody is above the covenant. Not even the leader of the people is above the law. Right, He also has to do this. Now, some people suggest, you know, maybe Moses um, in him being sick because otherwise he would have done it himself. He probably would have circumcised the child himself or because Zipporah comes from the line of Midian, then she knew how to do it because they were also descendants of Abraham. So she circumcises her son potentially could be why. Um, but regardless of it, it, Moses is laying there, right? He's the one. He doesn't really do anything in the story. And because of that, many people think that Moses was incredibly ill. And that's what it means by the Lord coming to kill Moses, is that he is on the way and he gets incredibly sick, right? So um, most people don't think it's God shows up with a knife to stab Moses and he's like trying to side skirt him, right? He's in a boxing ring trying to get away from God with a knife. Um, and then Zipporah circumcises their son and it's like a secret action that like saves Moses in the boxing ring. Um, it's more likely that Moses gets sick uh, given the context, and then in his illness, right, Zipporah saves him, and uh, he probably recovers because of his action, but they, now, the thing about it is, like Drew said, they, she knows what to do, right, which means they knew that not circumcising their son was wrong, right, so she knows exactly the right thing to do in the circum in this circumcision, this circumstance, um, and so she does that and saves Moses, right? Because he was going to die. So that's the real, uh, the real big issue here. Krista, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, do you, why would you interpret this more as an act of disobedience over the idea that the, the whole people somewhere along the line in their enslavement uh, simply lost their understanding of the um, of the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Does that make sense? Yeah, potentially that could have happened as well. But um, like I mentioned, the, the Hebrews were not the only people that practiced circumcision. Um, Egyptians practiced circumcision. And so um, if it is, then... The question would be even with like um, even if they weren't doing it for the religious purpose, they're probably because of the place that they live, we're probably still doing it for the cultural purpose. Um, so why hadn't Moses actually circumcised his son? And also that Midians, uh, Midianites did practice circumcision as well. And becoming or coming uh, from the line of Abraham, probably uh, I think that that is a central point to it. So. They might have lost the cultural practice in their time, um, but we clearly see that that was a command given for all people um, who wanted to be included into the covenant people of God. So I think that I do think that that's the central point or central reason because of what it says at the end where it says because of the circumcision. Right. So clearly that is the action that saves him. So the whole issue of Moses being sought to be killed is tied to that, um, the failure to do that. Can I ask a question too? Sure. So why, why does she need to touch Moses' feet? With yeah. The foreskin? It's a loaded question, Yona. So, uh, like I mentioned before, um, <clears throat> Hebrew does not have a word for sex, and the whole subject of genitals and sex is taboo 
And so it will actually use the word thigh and the word feet to talk about genitals. So when it says it, uh, she touched Moses' feet with it, she might not have touched his toes, right? Um, more likely, she touches his, um, yeah, his manhood, uh, his penis, whatever you want to say. I'm not uncomfortable saying it, but um, she probably touches her son's foreskin there. Now, people think that the reason that she does that. Now, what makes this passage so challenging is there are so few details. All right. We just know what happens. We just know God came to kill him. She circumcises him and somehow that saves him. All right. Um, circumcises the son and saves Moses. Okay. So we're not sure on, on a lot of details. And that's what makes this passage so hard. So what people suggest then is that Moses may not have been circumcised. And the action then is meant to save him because of his illness or because he might be close to death. So in doing that action to him, they don't want to endanger his life if he is at if he's at the point where he's close to death or if he's in danger for his life in some way, some reason, we don't know what it was that God came to sought to or seek to kill him. We don't know what was going on with that. So there's a, there are a lot of questions that revolve around this, but um, one of the things that we can look at here, this idea of protected um, could have a couple of uh, meanings that carry along with it in the languages that surround um, the Hebrew people, the word bridegroom here also can mean circumcision in Akkadian, in Hittite, um, and in Ugaritic, uh, as well as the um, later Arabic. So the other languages, the word, the same word bridegroom um, is also used as circumcision in these surrounding languages. So some people think that the ancient version of the word that the phrase would actually mean um, the uh, that it was, she was, he was protected through blood or protected through circumcision, sorry. So that, that could be the idea here. Instead of bridegroom of blood, it's the idea of like circumcision by blood or protection in that way. Just what, what's been suggested, I will be honest with you, there is not an easy answer for it. I'm just trying to give you guys the facts in here and then you can draw from that what you will, uh, but yeah, I think the whole point is that Moses was not walking in obedience to the covenant of God that had been laid out in the book of Genesis. Hey, Christer, so, Christer, I had a question. Sorry. Yeah, AC. Oh, yeah. Zach. Go ahead. Go after you. Um, fast forwarding to chapter six, it talks, uh, Moses says he has uncircumcised lips. Is he not circumcised either? Or we're not sure. Um, it seems that phrase is used for impure, like, I don't, I'm not good at speaking, is how okay. he uses it. Um, he could, I mean, it could be a reference to that, but it seems like a more of a figure of speech, a metaphor, than it is a literal statement. Um, some people do suggest Moses might not have been circumcised, which then ties into this idea that Daniel um, had brought up about the people not knowing the covenant. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so uh, in person, similar to, um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, let me uh, Wi-Fi for two seconds so you can, it comes in clear. Okay, like I was saying, um, rather than a protection of blood, could it potentially uh, like uh, signify uh, like a binding of blood similar to um, you know, when a husband and wife have sex, you know, they become one flesh. Could this in a similar fashion uh, be something like that, where he's kind of bringing a spiritual tie, if you will, between him and his son? The, I think the danger with that is how far then the metaphor goes that uh, it could be taken. Uh, I think it's a stretch. Simply to say, I think it'd be a stretch to go. Through. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, in this, simply to say, there isn't a final answer. Nobody who studies this passage has a final answer on it. Um, just to present the facts, um, it's not easy to understand 
what it means by bridegroom of blood. No one really knows. There's explanations. And you can find about 20 or 30 different interpretations on what that phrase might mean in context. Um, nobody knows if it was actually his genitals or his toes that she touched with her son's foreskin. Um, nobody really knows exactly why God came to kill Moses. All of these ambiguities in the passage make it a very challenging passage. And so um, we want to be aware of it. We want to maybe present what we think it could mean. Um, but at the end of the day, we're not going to find out what it means through our couple of minutes of study in the passage when people spend hours and days and weeks and months trying to figure out what it means, reading many different sources. So, um, yeah, just to be aware that it is a challenging passage here. But um, one thing I do want to talk about uh, for a moment here before we transition to Moses coming back to Egypt and the issues here in uh, 5, 6 through 9 um, is this word El Shaddai, because after the burning bush encounter, we see that God had said that the forefathers didn't know me by the name Yahweh, uh, but they knew him by the name God Almighty. So, so the name um, El Shaddai uh, is the name that is translated God Almighty in the text. But um, this, is, this name is not easy to define. In fact, we don't get the translation God Almighty from Hebrew. We get the translation God Almighty from the Greek. Okay, so we get it from the book of Job in the Septuagint. Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So the name El Shaddai um, is an incredibly hard uh, phrase to translate because of what it would literally mean in the Hebrew text. Because El is God, but Shaddai is a little harder to translate because the word shad means breast. So um, if you look at it in an ancient sense, you could say God of the breasts, and maybe you look at symbolic pictures of the provision of God um, or his sustaining of the people, that kind of thing. But even then, that is an incredibly hard sell because of the taboo nature of sexuality in the Hebrew culture. So it's highly unlikely that this would be a valid translation for this phrase, which is why then the English Bible goes with God Almighty. So the other thing is that shad in other cultures means mountain or hill. And the surrounding cultures, in fact, the ones that Abraham came from, um, the ancient Mesopotamian and Akkadian culture, um, they use the word shad for mountain or hill. Now, it's not a hard connection to make between breast and hill in the mind of, of imagery, right? So if we're connecting that idea, um, it's not hard to make that connection. So God of the mountain could, could potentially seem like a much more likely translation because God appears at many mountainous moments throughout the story, right? As Abraham is looking over all of the promised land, God says, this is going to be your land. It's up on a hill where he can see things. When he goes up to sacrifice Isaac, he's up on a hill, Mount Moriah. When Moses meets him in chapter three, he meets him at Horeb, a mount, the mountain of God, which is going to be called. They come back to Mount Sinai in uh, Ex Exodus chapter 19, when uh, they go up at, uh, <clears throat> when they go up to the promised land, they start to conquer the promised land. The only land that they take is the hill country because this territorial mindset of gods, right? They think the hill country is where Yahweh has the power. In fact, you see this in second Kings that even other nations think that God of Israel is the God of the mountains. And so they say, your God must be the God of the mountains, so we will fight you in the plains. And so they go out to the plains, and they fight Israel, and that's where they find that actually God is the God of everywhere. But it seems like other people thought of God as the God of the mountain, or God of the mountainous wilderness, or the mountainous areas. And so we see this with Mount Carmel, we see this with Moriah, we see this with Sinai, the whole land of Israel, the areas that the people occupied was the mountainous regions. And so it is likely that the people thought of God in that way. Now, if you live in Egypt where there are no hills and no mountains, and it is a flat land as far as the eye can see, maybe you think your God has no power, right? There is no mountains here, right? There's no place for God to meet us. Uh, and that is what is going to shape chapters five through nine is that God is not restricted to one location, right? God is not at one mountain. He's not at one place but he has power over all of the other gods. And that's what really chapter five um, through nine are communicating. And even on into chapter 12, as they celebrate the Passover here. But um, Daniel Heffley, would you read chapter five, verses one through two for us? 
Uh, yeah. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. All right, so this is going to be kind of your interpretive key for reading the entire uh, passages from 5 all the way through 12 or so. Um, this question of who is the Lord, right? Who is this guy you're talking about? And I have no idea who the Lord is, and I'm not going to let you go. Now, in Egyptian records, there is good record of them allowing slaves to go and worship at shrines in the desert. They would allow them to go on pilgrimages, to go out and worship at certain places. And so this request by Moses is not out of the ordinary culturally for the Egyptians. Um, but the fact that they're being they're asking to go worship a god that Mo, that Pharaoh has never heard of is the big deal, right? He's like, I don't know who that guy is, and so it, he gets, starts to get skeptical about it, right? This sounds fishy to me, and so the whole situation is showing who this god is, um, and then going to let the people go completely. So <clears throat> this could seem to be what comes up a, a number of times is that. The people would go out and worship and then return, but Moses clearly is asking for the people to be set free completely. So we get this deal with chapter five, and because of this request, then Pharaoh puts obviously more burden on the people. And then you get chapter six, and God promises deliverance, but the people don't want to hear this, right? They, they're being put to more work and harder labor, and they do not want to hear what Moses has to say. And I think that is incredibly discouraging um, to Moses and to Aaron. And so in 6, 2 through 9, they recount these promises. And in 6, 10 through 13, it says, So the Lord said to Moses, Go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am uncircumcised of lips. And so Moses is kind of complaining here. He says, You know, no one's listening to me. Not even our own people are listening to me. How should Pharaoh listen to me? And he's throwing himself a pity party here. And it says, but the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge about the people of Israel and about Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And Moses is throwing himself a pity party. No one's listening to me, God. No one is going to respond. Pharaoh won't hear me. And instead of God coming to him and he's like, it's okay, Moses, just try again. It's, you know, it's a learning experience for all of us. You no, know, Moses kind of puts his, or God puts his arm around Moses' shoulder and just says, you got to get back out there, buck up and be a man, right? That's what this idea of charge means. Um, he's not being an encouraging, comforting, nice situation. He's like, you got to get back out there and show me what you're made of. And uh, Moses is being trained by God. God, we want him to always be comforting and encouraging to us. And sometimes he's going to come and speak sternly to us and direct us and guide us and give us a firm hand. Um, he's not always going to be the sweet, comforting one that we want him to be. Why? Because he's a father, and fathers are there to be comforting, and they are there to guide you and teach you and train you, right? And so that's what we see with the story of Moses and Aaron here, and so they do. They get back out there, and they stand before Pharaoh, and they stand before the people of Israel, and they do their jobs, right? They do what God had called them to, okay? And that's what we see. So chapter seven, here's Michael's picture, right? Christian Bale of uh, Moses. <clears throat> they go out and they confront Pharaoh. So chapter seven, the, this is the first confrontation. And this is one of the greatest confrontations that we see. So we get the first sign here, right? And I, I would rather refer to the plagues as signs and not as plagues, Right, because there's a purpose behind each one of the things that are done, and that goes back to chapter five, verses one and two. Who is the Lord? And every single one of these signs is an answer to the question of who is the Lord. Right, so chapter five, verses one and two is going to be your interpretive key for these passages. And so in chapter seven, we get the sign of the snake. So they go before Pharaoh and they tell him to let their let his people go. Now, Aaron throws down his staff, turns into a snake. And the Egyptian magicians do the exact same thing. Now, how they do it, nobody really knows. There isn't a good answer for it. Do they actually turn it into snakes or is it just an illusion? Um, it seems that they actually turned it into snakes because in the story, Aaron's staff 
eats these snakes, right? Now, the sign is not that Aaron can turn his staff into a snake, right? Because if that was the case, then the Egyptians just match it. That's not the sign, right? The sign is that the snake eats the other snakes, right? That's the whole point of the story. And it shows superiority and supremacy over the gods of Egypt, right? In fact, the patron deity of the area where Israel lives is this snake god, Wadjet. So let me uh, bring this map over here. I don't know how well we'll be able to see this here, but here is a, a map of Egypt. Mount Sinai is over here. This is Sinai Peninsula. Up here, this is the, the area of Goshen. This is what is, we would call Northern Egypt. And that's actually in Egyptian culture, this area is called Lower Egypt. Okay, so they talk about it in reverse. Why do they talk about it in reverse? Because the river Nile flows from south to north. Okay, so this area is Lower Egypt because the Nile River flows this direction close to the north. And so this whole area is Lower Egypt. The patron god of this area is Wadjet, a snake god. And the staff of Aaron, the snake, eats the snakes of the Egyptian magicians, showing God's supremacy and superiority over the land and the region where the Israelites are currently living. Okay, so that's the whole point of what's happening here. <clears throat> We'll bring the map back if we need it, but I don't think we will the rest of this lecture. Christer, can you uh, say that again when it comes to it was in reverse or upside down or that concept? So lower Egypt is northern Egypt and upper Egypt is southern Egypt. Geographically. Okay, thank you. And the reason is, is because the Nile River flows south to north. Most rivers flow north to south. But the Nile flows in reverse uh, direction, so um, that's why it's called that. Which is so wild. Yeah. So, um, so that's the whole deal with the snake god here, right? Pharaoh wore um, two deities on his crown. He had a snake and a buzzard. The the snake is the patron deity of Lower Egypt, where the Israelites lived, and this buzzard or this. Um, bird of prey that was on his crown was the god of upper Egypt, okay? And so God is specifically asserting his authority over the region where the Israelites are living, saying, I am the god of this area. You thought you were, you thought this god was, and you served this god, but it's actually me who's more powerful. And that's going to be the answer to everything that's going on here, is this, this picture, these ideas. So um, the question, yeah, who's more powerful? Um, and that's what God is answering. Now, the plague here, I'm going to go for about another 10 minutes or so. We'll let out at uh, 1040 or 1145. Um, so I'll get as far as I can, and we'll pick up with tomorrow. Um, but these signs, the first sign is the water that turns to blood. All right. Now, um, the water that turns to blood, there are questions. Did the water really turn to actual human blood or animal blood or fish blood or what kind of blood was it? Right. Um, or did it turn... Or did it uh, grow algae? Now, um, in the Nile River, there is modern testimony of the Nile River turning a bright red color because of the type of algae that is growing in the Nile River. So some people think that the Nile River turning to blood was actually algae growing in the water rather than the water itself turning into blood. And the reason the Egyptians are able to dig through the dirt or the sand near the Nile is because the sand would filter out all of the algae. If the water had turned to human, fish, or animal blood, the dirt does nothing to filter the water. So when they're digging for water near the Nile, it's acting as a filtration system. Um, the water that was in their jars that turns into blood also would have been water that they, they had gathered from the Nile previously that had the algae in it, and it grows in the water. So that could be something that happens here. Um, it could be that it is actually blood and it turns to blood. Um, but then we would want to explain how they're digging for the water in the dirt actually would then purify the water. How does that clean or cleanse blood out of the water uh, for them? <clears throat> but uh, the deal with the Nile River, the Nile River is the central 
economic, social, religious piece of Egyptian geography and culture. Okay, the creation stories were centralized around what land rose out of the Nile or what gods rose out of the Nile River. It was the center of their economy, all their shipping up and down the river. It was the center of their livelihood in fishing and gathering from the Nile River. Um, it was a central part of everything they did. In fact, the papyrus that grew along the Nile River is where we get the first um, papyrus made in the world. And it's where um, we have records of mathematics and writing that advanced in this culture because papyrus was so abundant because of the Nile that grew along the Nile River. So all of this stuff um, is affected by this first sign. We have fish that are dying in the river and stinking in the river. Um, now, could be because of blood, could be because of algae, could they die? Um, this overwhelmingness here, regardless, it is a supernatural sign. But uh, what we do know is that in ancient Egyptian culture, a red Nile is an omen of worse things to come. Okay, so this is not the first time there's been a red Nile in Egypt's history, and it won't be the last time there's been a red Nile. Um, but the Bible interprets it through this lens of it turning to blood or turning this color red. Now, um, maybe that's a metaphor. Maybe it's a, a figure of speech just to call the river um, what is going on in it. But regardless of it, um, in Egyptian culture, Nile has turned red before. It does turn red again. And it's always a symbol of bad things to come. Things are going to get worse. And that's just exactly what happens here. Now, this, um, this sign is against the gods of the Nile, Happy, who is the god, specifically the god over the Nile River, and Hatmet, who is the goddess of fish, or the goddess over fishing. So um, it confronts these two gods and shows superiority over these deities. <clears throat> and we see that it happens for seven days, right? In 725, we get a time reference. Now, this is important to pull out because... There are not many time references in the plague chapters. So when there are time references, pull those things out. We're going to look at this with the grain and with the crops that are affected by the plague of hail in chapter 9. Um, that gives us a time reference. And then we have the Passover, which also gives us a time reference. So people ask, how long were these plagues? Were they all happening in a week? Did they happen in 10 days with these 10 signs? Um, or did they happen over a year? Did they happen over multiple years? And the time frame that we're looking at is at minimum three months. Okay, at minimum it's three months because of the type of crops that are affected in chapter nine are the crops that grow in January, and they would have been affected. But there are certain crops that are not affected that start to grow in February. So we have that at least in January, and then the Passover is always celebrated in the spring. And so at least plague number or sign number seven. Um, and then the Passover are three months apart. So these other plagues or other signs might have been also spaced out quite a bit. Um, we're not exactly sure. It probably does not happen um, so back to back to back that it's day after day after day or all on the same day or anything like that. Um, but the other ones, we don't know exactly how long they're spaced out for. Um, so what you see with this is that God is in control of the Nile River, right? And... Um, <clears throat> Yeah, he's control over all waters, over everything um, that there is. Now, the other thing about the season of time is if this happens in the time that usually the Nile River floods, then this would be happening in the late fall. So if this first sign happens around the season where the river Nile River floods, then it would most likely be around October, um, around this time in the year, actually. And um, the Nile River would swell really high and really large, overflowing its banks, which could be why all the frogs go out of the Nile River, why there's so many fish that stink on the land, and why so many die, um, and why there's so much red blood everywhere or red algae. Um, so that, that could be a potential option there. Now, uh, the, the next one, we're going to look at chapter 8 here, and I think we'll only have time to get through chapter 8. May not, maybe not even finish it, but... Um, the second sign here is the sign of the frogs. Now, the frogs probably leave the Nile River because of this blood in the river. Um, they go out of the river and they start going into people's homes. 
They start invading um, the businesses. They start going in the temples. They start going inside of people's beds, in their food dishes, in their water, in their grain. Frogs are everywhere, right? Now, why does Pharaoh ask Moses to get rid of the frogs? Couldn't the people have just gotten rid of the frogs on their own? It's not like they're being multiplied, right? They are everywhere, but it's not like they're just popping up thousands upon thousands upon thousands out of thin air, right? These frogs came from somewhere, right? They came from the Nile River. So you can kill these frogs. Well, not necessarily. The goddess Heket is the goddess of the frogs, and the goddess of Heket, or the goddess Heket is also the goddess of fertility. So she is the frog goddess and the goddess of fertility. So they viewed frogs as life. They're a symbol of life. And in the Egyptian culture, it was even at some times in their history that if you killed a frog, that you would deserve capital punishment. Sometimes if you, are, if you would have been caught crushing a frog or killing a frog, you could be killed in the Egyptian culture for doing this. So when the people are like, make the frogs go away, get them out of our houses, get them out of our beds, it's because they view the gods as a symbol of life or they view the frogs as a symbol of life and a symbol of fertility. So they're not willing to do to the frogs what they should be doing in killing them and getting rid of them. Okay, so <clears throat> the thing to notice with these uh, plagues also is you see the magicians replicating them, right? The magicians replicate the blood, they replicate the snake, they replicate the uh, frogs. And what does that tell us in this, right? You would think the magicians could make it better, right? If they were actually good magicians and they actually had power, then they would restore the sign or the plague upon the people. Instead, they just make it worse, right? They say, oh yeah, we can do that too. And they make things bad, right? And so it just shows that the power of the Egyptian magicians are actually nothing than just reproducing the evil things that are being done or the, the uh, um, judgment that's being done to the people, okay? So <clears throat> they have all these frogs and then Moses or Pharaoh asks for Moses to get rid of the frogs and they get rid of the frogs and in 8.8, 8, right? It says Moses called Pharaoh or um, Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, plead with the Lord to take away the frogs from me and from my people and I will let uh, the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. Um, and so they call the frogs to go away. Um, and the Lord did according to the word of Moses in verse 13, the frogs died out in the houses, the courtyards and the fields and they gathered them together in heaps and the land stank, right? So <clears throat> imagine... You have grown up as an Egyptian and your entire life, frogs have symbolized life and fertility. And now they are steaming piles of dead, rotting flesh in your land. And what once brought life is now a pile of death, right? The parallels here of the supremacy of God over their deities and over their polytheistic mindset is so easy to see. And this is answering that question. Who is the Lord? Well, the Lord is the one who brings life. Right, he's the one, not your God. He's in control of all of the land, right? From the Nile River to the frogs that bring life, right? God is the one who is in control. And then we have the gnats um, for these flies that come up in, uh, sorry, the flies are the next one. We have the gnats here. And uh, many people think these are connected with one another, right? So you have the Nile that turns to blood, the frogs leave the Nile and they come out of the Nile. And then you have um, the gnats, which probably most likely were mosquitoes. Um, that all breed in the standing water from the flooded Nile. And so you have these three that are very strongly connected with one another. And so they could um, build off of each other. Now we would ask the question, okay, or we would think in our Western modern perspective, well, that's just naturally how it happens. That's natural disasters. Those are natural plagues. That wasn't God doing it. That was natural. So the Hebrew mindset, that is God doing it because God is in control of nature. And so it doesn't matter whether it happened, quote, naturally, or it doesn't matter whether it ha happened as a natural disaster, because God is the one who's in control of all of nature. And so when these things happen, they have a perspective, God did this, right? God is the one who brought these plagues. So whether it's supernatural or whether it is the, uh, purely a natural disaster, uh, it does not matter because the whole point is that God shows his control over each one of these things. So the gnats come, right? This shows power over Geb the God of the earth and the God of dust. And so Moses hits the ground with the dust or hits the ground with the staff um, and all of these mosquitoes come and start biting the people. And from here on, the magicians can't reproduce the plague. Um, they are not able to. And as well, this plague begins to affect the priests. 
So um, the other ones wouldn't have affected the cleanliness of the priest, but uh, these ones do affect the cleanliness of uh, the Egyptian priests who had to stay pure before their gods to intercede on their behalf. Now the Egyptian priests, because of the uncleanness, potentially have these gnats or uh, mosquitoes, the bites that are given to them, um, are not able to go before their gods. Now, the final one is the flies here, and we're going to just end on this today. Um, and in 822, um, we have the statement, but on that day I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people dwell, so that the swarms of flies um, shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Now, this is the time where the plagues will begin to not affect the Israelites the same as they affect the Egyptians. Okay, so that's an important designation. God is going to say, I am not only in control of everything, but I'm in control enough that these things will affect you and not my people. Right? And that's what we see with the flies. Um, the God of the flies is Uchit. And uh, the reason that there is a God of the flies is because there are specific types of flies in the Egyptian area. And so, and these flies are dangerous flies. Okay. <clears throat> The there's two options for these flies. The first one is a gad fly, and uh, the gad fly is a blood sucking dog fly. That's the more common uh, rendition of it. So, a blood sucking dog fly, and these are a great abhorrence to people um, because they their bites and the diseases that they transfer can actually cause blindness. Okay. So that is uh, something that they are concerned about. The other one that it could be in, in this area of the world is an ichneumian fly. And that type of fly deposits larva into living things that will then, that larva feeds on the flesh uh, of the animal and ends up killing it or coming out of its flesh. Now that's super nasty. And that is right. It's really nasty. Well, the next thing to come is the death of the livestock. So these two flies then, or the type of fly, could influence then the next plague, the death of the livestock. Um, the Septuagint, which was translated from Hebrew into Greek in, the, in uh, the city of Alexandria in Egypt, in the Septuagint, they actually call this type of fly the gadfly, which is that blood-sucking dog fly. So um, that is most likely what this is, that type of um, bug, because the people who actually live in Egypt who are translating this text label it that. Um, in their time. Now, maybe Moses didn't have a specific word to translate it as at the time, and so he just uses the general Hebrew word for fly. They may not have a specific word for fly, but in the Greek, they do have a specific word, um, and they use that. Now, these flies might have come because of all of the rotting flesh of the frogs, right? And we know rotting flesh produces maggots, and that maggots grow into flies, and that could be what happens here. So there is that potential connection. Not saying it has to be, it can be supernatural acts that are all distinct from one another and happen in their own distinct sequence. Um, but just to notice, there is some natural progression that goes on. So that's where I'm going to leave us off for today. We're going to get into chapter nine um, tomorrow, and we'll finish up with the plagues at the beginning of our session there. And we'll get into chapter 10 with the other plagues. Um, and we will talk about the hardness of hardening of Pharaoh's hearts as well. So don't think I missed that or skipped over it. And um, we will talk about that tomorrow. So um, I'm going to pray and then we can take any questions and then you guys will be free to work on the book of Exodus. So Lord, thank you so much for this book. God, thank you, Lord, for all that you um, would speak to us through it. I pray that as the students go through this book, this powerful, powerful book that tells us so much about who you are, I pray that they would be impacted, God, by your character. They'd be impacted by these stories, Lord they would have a greater understanding of who you are, Lord, and that you would really move them, God, um, in seeing who you are, Lord. I pray that you would open up the book of Exodus to them, um, and they would encounter you through it, Lord, as they pray, as they chart, as they work on their BRI, God. Um, I pray that they would just be enthralled by who you are um, and be radically impacted by the book of Exodus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Are there any questions? If not, you guys can go. Yeah, Chris, you're, oh. Yeah. Sorry. I have a question, and Sarong, you might have actually answered it uh, through Messenger. I haven't checked yet. But um, my question was about future books you were talking about. So we would do, for Leviticus, we would do the read out loud. Then we would do PTs. And then 
you said that we would have to do um, the have the rough horizontal and checked before the first lecture. Is that saying we're doing all three of those in one day? Yeah. You start with the read of Leviticus at 8 a.m. It'll take you roughly about two and a half to three hours. So you'll be done around 11 or so. Um, then you can start your PTs and finish your eat your lunch in about 30 minutes or 40 minutes. And then you can finish your PTs before you go to work duty or so in about four hours total. And then you can do your work duty. You can come back, you can have dinner, and then you can do your horizontal before 10 p.m. What about that workout we need, right? You can fit that in before you start your class in the morning. Before you have your first read, wake up at seven o'clock, you can work out for 30 minutes and you can eat breakfast no. after that, after you shower, and then you can uh, do your out loud read. Wait, so you're telling us that there are people who finish it in three hours? <laughs> the book of Leviticus? Start. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. All, all is well, all is well. It's uh, the SBS is going to teach you a lot of time management. And uh, if you guys are concerned about time, um, you can talk to Daniel Hefley, who has three kids and a wife um, and is doing uh, SBS right now. Or you can talk to me, who's got a 21 month old child and is leading the SBS. And I can help you out with time management also. It's not so much a time management, it's much more of like, reading it quick <laughs> and you'll you'll pick up on that also this is where you're also in a reading school um and that is a skill that we are learning as well here is how to read well um and it's something that you will get better at as you go along through the school if you are intentional about it that was krister putting his arm around you and telling you to man up Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Dad. Um, Miss uh, Krister. Yes. So, uh, where is the call center? That is uh, from as far as I know. Um, it's gosh, it's in one of two places, man. It's either in the next to the mail room, the DTS office area, or it's at the bottom of the hill um, in the other building across from the SBS classroom. Did anybody go to the call center yesterday that can tell Lauren? Yeah, so um, call center for right now, you're actually gonna be doing it from your laptop in your rooms and your phones, your personal phones. Um, Chris will let you know. Uh, I don't know if he will send you an email, uh, but yeah, so you're gonna be doing it from your rooms until they could open up the call center to level three, I think it is. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Yeah, contact Chris Lindman and ask him uh, any other clarifying information. You can get his contact from Luke also. Okay, thank you. Okay, you guys are free to go as you need. <laughs>